Okay, hi boys and girls. Um, we're here at the Biltmore Hotel, fabulous spot. And I'm here with uh, Scott Saunders from KW Plastics. And he's gonna tell us a little bit about what's going on with recycling, um, and especially in the area of polypropylene and polyethylene. And, um, and quite frankly, um, most people aren't really excited about, uh, about recycling. But uh, you've already found markets to sell to that, um, that are red hot. So anyways, first, before you do that, Scott, can you give us a little background on yourself, uh, KW, and all the kind of like things that you've been going through? You know, contrary to popular belief, plastic recycling is a very successful and vibrant business. We've actually uh, been uh, in, the, in the business since uh, 1981. Uh, we got started recycling car battery cases. And now that is the number one closed loop system for recovery uh, of, of any product at about 98 or 97 percent. Now, we, when you talk about car batteries, you're talking about 12 volt battery uh, 12 volt yeah, lead yeah, acid yeah, batteries okay. with a polypropylene case. Right, yeah, got that it. That got us into the business. And from there, we evolved into recycling uh, high density polyethylene, which are your milk bottles, your laundry detergent bottles. Uh, we evolved into recycling yogurt containers. We actually launched that program in 2012 with Waste Management, and now that is a national program and growing every year. Mm. Uh, we also recycle bulky containers, which are five-gallon pails and pallets and totes. Oh. Um, we support the automotive industry, the packaging industry, and the agricultural industry, and then just general purpose um, um, injection and blow molding. So let me ask you a question, because um, I see, like I've never really worked in a recycling area, but I have worked a lot on shooting PP and other things. And, um, and as a rule, it wants to be really clean. How do you, how do you uh, take in basically old yogurt cans and, right. and turn it into? So our, our system is, is a proprietary system that we built in-house. That is a eight tank system where we use uh, really aggressive uh, friction uh, and, and some heat and chemistry to cl thoroughly clean the material, to size reduce it, thoroughly dry it. We elutriate it to take all the labels and light contaminants out. And then we melt filter it, uh, extrude it into pellets, and then thoroughly blend the material. Mm. Um, and at the extruder, we can add a variety of additives and, and modifiers to give it a little impact, to give it a little color, maybe some mineral, for, to, to really take the material where we need it to go. So we're taking a, uh, a food container or, or a container for detergent maybe designed to last a couple of weeks in a market, modifying it slightly and getting it into a product designed to last 10 to 12 years. Wow, can I ask you a question? We've been, we've been talking before this started here and can you, can you do anything with PVC? Because I mean, I, uh, I went to a farm uh, last year sometime. Holy crap, they got a mountain yeah. of pipes. Uh, is right. there anything we can do with that? You, you, you could. That wasn't, wouldn't work in our systems. Hmm. Our systems are all designed to recover the items that float in water yeah. and, and let the, the more dense uh, contaminants sink away. I see. Uh, so that's why we focus on the, the olefin materials. PP, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, anyways, it was a good idea. But that's, that's something that, I mean, every farm mm -hmm. um, in Michigan, Ontario, Ohio, Indiana, all of them, right. uh, they, uh, they use it for irrigation. And mm -hmm. that would be a, a, there you go, you should write that down. Yeah, right, right, right PPC. <laughs> I mean, that's, we, you know, we, we look for anything with critical mass, yeah. right? And if, if there's critical mass, which would be 50 to 100 million pounds annually yeah, of something yeah. generated, uh, and the ability to get it collected, then we will try to develop a process uh, to, to take that material in and return it back to the marketplace. So unlike, unlike a lot of recyclers, we're not owned by a packaging company. Mm. So we, we look to solve problems and develop resins around different solutions. But you've had some successes that I, I wasn't quite aware of, yeah. uh, especially in the interiors. Of my, can you, uh, can you uh, basically give us, a, like if it's, um, if it's not in the eye of the public, it seems like that's your target market. It, it is, basically things under the hood Right. Uh, where we have, the, of course, the car battery. Uh, yeah. We have HVAC ductwork that's just primarily high density polyethylene from laundry detergent bottles. Right. Uh, we also have a lot of parts for stone protection, uh, bumper fascia covers, 
a lot of little small parts inside the glove box of various hmm. models for various manufacturers. Most of our material would be not seen by the public, just right, like yeah. that type of stone protection. And that allows us to take the materials that are mixed color with mixed pigments coming in, uh, make them black, but not maybe a color match black, uh, yeah. and, and support different product uh, uh, programs. Hmm. Well, one of the other options too is um, a lot of the componentry that we use for uh, glove boxes and one, and, um, and um, uh, center consoles and whatnot, they usually get uh, coated in something called um, uh, flocking. Um, and um, you, you can have any color underneath it, yep. and you spray flocking on it, it turns black, and it gives you that fuzzy feel. Right. Have, you ever, have you ever done anything like that? that that's nothing a, that right? we have any expertise in. That would uh, be our, our customer, but it's, it's certainly a fantastic idea as a way well, to get you, more recycled content yeah. into the car. Well, not only that, it, it would, I'm thinking it's, well, let's, let's, let's hit on that. Yep. What's the difference between recycled um, uh, PP and, um, and polyethylene? What's the difference in price between recycled versus uh, virgin? Well, I mean, typically we're saving our customers money. Um, yeah. You know, when the markets for HDPE and polypropylene are at the bottom, right as they are today it's it's difficult yeah you know, because we are competing with the most efficient system i think created which is the chemical delivery of gases through a pipeline right yeah. into a reactor so it's very difficult to, for us to compete when you have ethylene and propylene in the 40s high 30s low 50s um, but typically we're a cost savings today we're probably cost neutral maybe a little bit more uh, but it, it is our goal to save our customers money where we can Hmm. Hmm. So, what do you see the um, what, what do you see as the future for um, for you and your company and uh, and the recycling business in general? Well, I see us to continue to evolve away from simply a commodity business uh, and to more of a OEM or brand owner solution company. And hmm. we work with OEMs and brands that are either European based or U.S. based to get recycled material and various components of their either their packaging stream or or their or their mm. finished product well one of the things we heard about was in europe um basically if you don't have a um a plan in place or you're not doing it right now uh using um, um uh, recycled material you're, you're going to have an issue right. they're going to come after you uh, do you see anything like that or has that helped you out and then after that do you see anything like that happening here in the U.S.? Well, it, it does help us because a lot of brands that are based in Europe have a global strategy for including recycled material. Mm -hmm. And so it makes them more open in the U.S. Uh, I gave an example today of a, of, a, of a food company that wanted to use recycled material, couldn't really find a good application in direct food contact. We got into another part of their portfolio that was a cat litter container so oh, that so, that was a great example right I, yeah, yeah go so ahead. that was a collaboration between us and the brand and they were able to take the recycle material to a, into a non-critical application but consume big volumes of material hmm. so we continue to work with brands and oems trying to find that and yeah. we try to tell them you know if, if you can't use a recycle material directly in your consumer facing product and what about your shipping container? What about your overwrap? Right. right? What about the pallet that, that's returning into the system? What about totes that are in your plant where you're moving parts right. around? Yeah. There are many ways that a company can affect recycled material and the environment in a positive way that maybe won't affect the, the uh, look or the feel of their product. I know that, um, you know, I, uh, my wife is a big fan of recycling yep. or, or taking bottles back, tragically. Um, I put them in the recycle bin, and if somebody happens to sh get an extra nickel, that's good enough yeah, for me. Right. But I'm thinking, why don't we just have something at the supermarket that's kind of like a store, right. and um, you bring back anything that's plastic, and suddenly uh, the problem goes away. I don't get it. I, I think that um, you know, plastic did great things for reducing initial distribution. Over, over glass and metal, right? So in glass, you have to worry about breakage. It's, right. the, it's very heavy and dense to, to distribute. Plastic solves all those problems. The problem with plastic is it's so light and so efficient at the end of life, it's more expensive to collect. No, I'm saying let's put five cents on each one of these things, so, and I bet you dollars the donuts. Like, um, so I have uh, a couple of people in my company yep. 
uh, that um, are, um, what do you call them? Uh, uh, they basically look at trash and, um, and, uh, and take the good stuff. And one lady, Jackie, found a diamond that's worth a stinking fortune, the size yeah. of my baby finger, or the bottom, the top yeah. of my baby finger. So they, uh, they, you know, they, they, they do this all the time. Right. Well, I'm telling you what, if, if there was nickels involved in here, right. uh, there's uh, So if, if you look at the states with a deposit, Michigan is a state with deposit on, on PET. Um, they have a recycling rate of 65 or 70 percent. And you look at the states without a deposit, like my state, it's eight or nine percent of Alabama. Colorado's eight or ten percent. So it, they work. They're not yeah. popular um, because well, the, how they're know. run and how they're managed and, and, and companies feel like they're being disadvantaged. But if that was spread out over all plastic containers where everybody felt they were participating, yeah. it, would, it would generate a lot of material. It would solve a lot of the pollution issues that we see. Yeah. So, I, you know, I think it could be a very positive thing. Well, I think what, uh, what like I'm no tree hugger by any stretch of the imagination, but uh, I can tell you for sure, when I flew, I was flying to um, either Thailand or Singapore, and you fly over that big vortex in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, you right. look down and you go, good God, this is a disaster. It and is. the plane's going like 650 miles an hour, and you're looking down at garbage, plastic garbage mostly, right. and you're looking down on it for 15 or 20 minutes. Yeah, that's, a, that's, a, that's an island. It, it's, it, that is terrible, but you know, when you, when you take a look at what that material is, it is typically items that blow off of fishing boats and fishing lines. It is a very small amount of that as packaging. Oh, it, to me, it, looked, it was very colorful. I yeah. don't know what it was, but, um, yeah. but there were more colors than a rainbow. It was like a, amazing how big that area was and how dense it looked. Because as the waves come up, they hit that thing and, and it just kind of washes it, over. It, yeah. it just it just looks dead flat. So um, wow, I was wondering why somebody didn't come in there. I mean, and uh, and start scooping it. But I mean, where do you take it to? You're you're out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. How do you recycle that? There's just no way. Right, right. So you know, um, it, it needs to be cleaned up, but it's yeah. not going to be economically viable to clean it up. Yeah, but to me, it would take all nations coming together and you know first wow. of all stop the material from coming off of shipping vessels stop it from being discharged discarded into rivers um yeah. and clean up what you've got you can solve that problem well i i think uh, it might be easier if we just make it so that it has value right i mean when you um when um in africa they were worried that people were shooting elephants for the ivory and whatnot okay um so what they did was they just said if there's elephants on your property we'll pay you X. And if an elephant uh, mm -hmm. dies or disappears, uh, you don't get X. Yeah. And, um, and all of a sudden, the farmers who owned that property, well, they didn't have right. to worry about poachers because, you know, a 30 out six is about <laughs> this long and, he, and the right. poachers kind of like vanished. Right. That's, right. Uh, that's kind of, when, when something has value, right. People will do something about it. I think. Right. Uh, I think the idea of uh, putting a nickel on every uh, on every bottle of uh, whatever that you can recycle and get your money back on. I mean, that would be brilliant. That, I, that, that's what's required, I think, to to incentivize that homeowner not yeah. to just pitch it into the trash. Well, even right. more than that. I mean, like I say, if you've got pickers and right. uh, they're seeing these things, like I say, nickels add up. up. Right. And I know um, when I was a kid, I <laughs> did not grow up poor. I grew up poor. I did not have right, a whole right. lot of money uh, floating around and, um, and uh, collecting pop bottles and stuff like that. No problem. I'll take that all day long. That's right. So if we make it so that trash has got some value. Right. And like I say, I wouldn't even send it back. I wouldn't take it back to a grocery store or something. No. They hate that. It doesn't, it's nothing for them. But if there's some kind of a giant area... Put your bottles in here, put your cans in there, and your plastic bottles well, you, you over know, here. Every, every state has a recycling infrastructure for metal, right? Yeah, there, exactly. There's scrap metal yards that buy cans, that buy ferrous, non-ferrous. Yeah. Th this would be something that would flow right into that stream. Yeah. Right? And they'd have to have some way to be remunerated back from the state. Yeah. But, you know, the, the one problem you have is if one state has a deposit, one doesn't, 
there's a lot of fraud that happens, right? Um, but if you had something regional or national um, where it didn't matter where the bottle was purchased, you could turn it in and get that, yeah. you wouldn't have that issue. Exactly, and that's what I think it should be. But again, this is my area of expertise, but it seems to me that there's a, yep. there's a, a lot of ways to make, uh, to make the problem go away. And I'm big on making problems go away, so. So Scott, yes. I, I could be wrong, but I think we're done here. But I, I, I really appreciate uh, the Certainly. conversation. Yeah, thanks for I, having I me I wish on. you uh, and KW a, a huge amount of success. I'm sure that uh, I'm sure that there's a government person in listening, <laughs> right? Yeah. And uh, they'll be getting in contact with you. We'll that put your fantastic. put your contact information on the bottom. That sounds great. Okay, great. Well, thank you. Thank you so and much. Thank you for watching. Bye everyone. Bye.